Good afternoon. And hello to you. Thank you. We're here today with former Representative Milton Burkus, who served the 140th Legislative District from Bucks County between the years 1967 and 1974. Thank you for agreeing to be here with me today and represent Emilio's office. Yeah, my pleasure. I wanted to begin by asking you about your childhood and your family life and how you feel that that prepared you to be a public servant. My parents were immigrants. Uh, they came from R Romania and they came to this country in 1920. I was born four years later. Uh, interestingly, my sister was born five days after they landed in America. So she became a citizen by five days. Um, they, they, they came from a poor family, but they managed to bring all of their relatives over, get them out of uh, Eastern Europe in time, you know, just in time. And uh, of course, we're Jewish and they were really facing pogroms and all of that business. And uh, At any rate, um, uh, we grew up in a section of Philadelphia called Strawberry Mansion. And it was a great place to live because it was right on the edge of Fairmount Park. And Fairmount Park was our playground. It was big, it's, it's still one of the biggest city parks in the country and uh, had all kinds of things we could do and play with. So that was a good place to grow up. And um, I had a lot of friends and we had gangs, but our gangs were organized not to fight but to play baseball and to play football and, and um, that kind of thing. And well about um, in the, when I, gra well, I, when I graduated, I went to uh, elementary schools down in that area. And then I went uh, to high school. It was Central High School, which was the uh, premium school for, for high school academically, but we had 9A and 9B, and I was there for 9A, and then they moved. And for 9B, I had a choice of going to Central High School um, in uh, where they were located, which uh, would require me taking three buses, or staying at the old school, which was named Ben Franklin, and I got to Ben Franklin uh, very easily by hopping on the back of a truck and going down Ridge Avenue and jumping off the truck when it got to Broad Street, if it would stop, and <laughs> then walk a couple of blocks over. So it was a, really a question. We were still a poor family, and, uh, and I didn't go to Central because I couldn't afford the, that. At any rate, uh, I graduated Benja Benjamin Franklin in 1943, January, and two months Two months uh, later, I was drafted and I was off to the war. So in terms of my, my early childhood, it was, it, it was trying times, but it was happy times because it didn't matter that we didn't have um, money. My father worked very hard and, and um, uh, he was a uh, leather worker and they worked, uh, he worked in a, a um, a suitcase factory and what happened is they would call him into work when they needed him but then they'd lay him off for weeks at a time and of course it was a pre de at the time of the um, depression which was 1929 uh, I was five years old and uh, going on till Roosevelt was elected in 32 and and beyond and um, I remember my father selling uh, apples on the street and Market Street, and he would walk all the way from our house, which was about five miles, to a spot on Market Street and put his apples out on the stand and sell them. And, and the significance of that is, because they couldn't get work then, the significance of that is that one day he had his apples piled up at home, and I was hungry, and I grabbed an apple without telling him, and he got so angry at me but my mother defended me, and, and uh, in their way, um, I learned a lesson there. But at any rate, um, I did a lot of little things in those days. I sold newspapers for a while, and um, 
uh, when I was a teenager, I worked for a local uh, uh, local newspaper. I, I did advertising. Mag I solicited ads for them. And um, then I, I worked part-time at the Acme Markets. And, uh, that was the last... No, and, and, and after I graduated high school, I worked at the Acme all through uh, my high school. I had to lie about my age, but they didn't care because they needed people to work there. And that was my first experience with unions. It was very important to me because they had a, a, um, a, a union representative who was a state representative. I forget his name, but it was years ago. And he would come around every Saturday and he'd collect our union dues. Those of us who were temporaries, I think we were paying him three dollars a week or whatever it was. But that's when I first um, had contact with unions. Uh, later on, I, I became a very strong union person. My father was a very liberal person, but I would have called him a, um, a, dem a, social, a democratic socialist because he believed in democracy, of course, coming out of that, that terrible place where he was raised. And, um, but at the same time, he was so anti-communist uh, at a time when the Communist Party was flourishing, particularly in neighborhoods like that with a lot of uh, refugees uh, coming in. And th the neighborhood at that time was all Jewish. So, you know, and, and they were mostly from Eastern Europe. And, but, but they used to, I remember that there would be on Sundays, uh, the leader of the Communist Party in that area would bring a soapbox and stand on it and preach right in the middle of the street. And everybody would gather there and my father would throw fruit at them and, and, and they got into that kind of thing because his experience in Europe was, his last experience was with the, the Russian Revolution. He lived on the border of Russia and, and always told a story about in World War I, he would first serve in the Romanian army and then the Russians would grab him and he'd serve in the Russian army and, and was just a bridge between Russia and Romania. So um, he always told that story and he hated and he called them Bolsheviks. Uh, but he was socially uh, progressive and um, I guess I've got my liberalism uh, from him. And um, at any rate, my mother grew up um, also um, uh, helped uh, to the, with that. She never went to school, never went to school at any, anywhere in, in Europe. She um, went to work when she was eight years old, sewing in a uh, factory, and um, she had no, no learning at all. And as a matter of fact, she never learned to speak English after coming here until the day she died. And we could, I, I remember uh, going with her and my older sister uh, to take her down to the customs house in Philadelphia every year where she had to register as an alien. And she would do that and we would sit down and try to teach her to sign her name. She couldn't even do that. It was just she had no learning ability because she had never gone to school. So she lived her life without ever going to a movie except when there was a, an occasional Yiddish picture and uh, uh, she loved that and she'd go to see that or, or play. Uh, which was more open those days. So that's, that's where I, I got my background. And I also, I had a, a real deep feeling for health uh, problems because both my sister and my brother, and they skipped me, I was in between them. My brother was five years younger, my sister was four years older than me. Somehow the genes jumped over me. Uh, they both had mul uh, muscular dystrophy. Uh, my brother had it very serious and very early and it was a rare form and he also had club feet and he was sick all his life and he was in the hospitals all the time. And um, uh, my sister had a minor form of muscular dystrophy 
and she lived to be 83, 84. Um, and, but, but in her later years, in her 70s, it, it really affected her quite a bit. So that's where I got my commitment for, for the health system. And my commitment to education I got by going to, to school in, in, in a tough neighborhood and a, and a tough place and knowing the difference between getting a good edu education and not. Now, the other thing that happened that, that's important is at first when I went to high school, I took the academic course and that was fine. But then it was obvious that I'd never go to college. Uh, my parents didn't, you know, no way they could ever send me to college. So in my last year, I changed to a course called Distributive Education, which dealt with uh, people who work in like the supermarkets or, or um, department stores and things like that. And uh, it, was, it was fun. I was a fair student. I, I got good grades, but never all A's. I'd get some A's and some B's and some C's. But when I switched to distributive education, which was an easy course, I got all A's. And that, that, that was very important later on because when I went into the Army and I went to basic training down in uh, Florida and they put, put you all cut through all kinds of things besides the, the physical training, um, Suddenly, after about a month down there, they shipped me off to the, the Citadel in South Carolina, I think it is, and they were interviewing people for a special program called the Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP. And because I had all those A's, you know, I was eligible. And, and I went through uh, a lot of testing there, and I, I tested positive, and they sent me to the ASTP program instead of out with an infantry division, and that was in New York at, um, I think it was uh, Brooklyn College or, yeah. So I stayed in that course and um, about, uh, it was almost a year, and they broke up the whole ASTP program because at that time, that was now 1944, they were had to build up their infantry forces for the invasion of Europe. And most of the people that were my buddies up there, they went into the infantry, but for some reason I was sent to Fort Monmouth to radio school. And then I realized why, because when I was in high school, I took a club, the radio club, and I learned how to deal with radios and Morse code and all that kind of, which was fun. I did it for fun. And because of that background, I got into radio school. So I, I, I uh, learned, I uh, trained on field radios and um, um, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And then they sent me back to New York to learn how to operate submarine cables. These were these transoceanic cables where they communicated, you know, uh, from like, across the ocean. And I learned that, and um, uh, after that was done, uh, we shipped out to the South Pacific. Now, uh, you, do you want me to get into that now? Because that's an important sure. part of my background. Um, the first place we stopped, in, 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 incidentally, when I got on a ship and uh, we went cross country by train, and that was the first time I was on a cross country trip of any kind. And then we got on this ship, and that was the first time I was on a ship. But at any rate, um, uh, we were, um, we, the first place we stopped was in New Guinea in a place called Hollandia Harbor. And that, that was really nothing but a, a artificially built harbor for that purpose of, and uh, it was in New Guinea, and we were there about two weeks. And I frankly never left the ship because there was no fit, nothing to do, no place to go. There was a bar in town, but I didn't drink. I was never a drinker. And, and so I had no interest in getting off. Um, and then we went to 
uh, the Philippine Islands, where I spent most of my time overseas. We landed first in Leyte, and um, in Leyte Island, there was a mud hole. Uh, but we landed there, and we stayed there a couple, about a month, and then we were, got back on a ship and went to um, Luzon, where Manila is and the capital is, because the cable station was in Manila. But we couldn't get there when I first got there because it was still Japanese occupied. And what ha we, we were camped right outside of Manila, and right near Santo Tomas uh, University, which was the uh, place where the Japanese kept American prisoners uh, who were not in the service, not in the armies, but were there in the Philippines when they invaded. And, and they were treated pretty harshly. We got to see them and talk to them at times. Uh, then um, the thing that uh, impressed me the most, it's, it's got to be stupid, but it impressed me the most when I was there, was every time we, we would have mess call, you know, three times a day, and uh, we'd eat what we want to eat, and then we'd go out to those big garbage cans to dump what we didn't eat. And there was a line of kids, Filipino kids, with tin cans waiting for us to come out. And we would dump our food into their tin cans. And as soon as they got it filled, they'd run and take it home. And, and that kind of poverty really affected me. I mean, we had poverty when I grew up, but I never had to go with a tin can and stand there in a garbage pail and take garbage. And what we used to do, we would order, we would get more food than we could eat. So we'd have more to give to the kids. And they came back later and would do errands for us and shine our shoes and things like that. And, and the young girls would come and they'd do our laundry. And so we had that kind of relationship with them. But when we went to look at the cable station, the Japs had blown it up. And there was nothing there. So we had to rebuild it. So while waiting to rebuild that that station, we had to wait for material to come from the States. Uh, we had to do all kinds of different things. Uh, for a while, I was charged a quarters, which meant that I would, in, in the nighttime, on a night shift, that nobody else wanted to take. I, I would answer the telephone or the radio, because I could do the uh, Morse code if it came in, and um, on a night shift. So that was a while. And then one day they needed uh, some guys to go uh, guard a farmhouse. Now, who are we guarding it from? We were guarding it from other <laughs> U.S. soldiers and guarding it from the Filipinos because a lieutenant from another outfit, the ship was just coming in, had been there in advance and grabbed that farmhouse from the farm. That's where he wanted to have his headquarters. So we had to keep it from being taken over by somebody else. So we did that for a while. Um, but then uh, we were really, let's see, in, in August of 44, the atomic bomb was dropped, and of course we were happy. I never knew what was, what, I didn't even know what it was. And, and that was dropped, and uh, the reason we were happy is because they were taking guys like us that, that weren't doing anything and retraining them to be infantry for the invasion of Japan. And, and we'd gone through some of that training, it was just the beginning of it, and, uh, and the talk was that the invasion of Japan would be the greatest loss in the history of the world for the troops, and it would have been, if, because Japan was such a small island in terms of um, depth, uh, that, um, and, and they were fanatic, they, they fought every step of the way. They, they would rather die than surrender, and so it was that kind of thing. But then the war ended, and we were shipped to Japan anyhow in the uh, occupation, and um, uh, we never did get to know Japanese because the Japanese people because they were afraid of us. And if we go walking down the street, uh, we lived in a um, uh, we lived in a uh, stadium, a baseball stadium. Uh, we camped under under the uh, stands, and we worked in Kobe. We li lived in Kyoto, which was a beautiful city, untouched by the war. It was gorgeous.
and, and an ancient city. Uh, and we, we, every morning we're transported to Kobe, where the 6th Army headquarters was uh, for the southern part of Japan. And we'd work in the communications room. Um, and we did that for a couple, maybe three months or four months. And at the time, they were, you know, the war was over, both in Germany and, and in Japan. And they were discharging uh, the soldiers on the basis of a, a point system. You got five points for every time you were in an area that was um, uh, under fire. Uh, and uh, so I was on three different areas, so I had 15 points there and get five points for a, a good conduct medal, five points for something else. But it wound up, and I will always remember that, I had 55 points and every day we would look in Stars and Stripes, which was the, the uh, paper that came out every day uh, over there for the military. And we'd watch the numbers go down, so 100, 20, 90, 80, 70. When it got down to 60, I said, oh boy, I'm ready. And sure enough, um, uh, they told us uh, to um, gather our gear and be ready to disembark the next day. Well, that night, we, we lived, uh, at that time, we lived in big wooden barracks. They took us from the stadium and to, to the embarkation place. And there were two-story wooden barracks. There were a whole bunch of them. I don't know what they were used for originally, uh, but we, we were living in them. And then in the middle of the night, a fire broke out in the barracks next to us. And everybody is rushing out, and uh, uh, our, our people, uh, the sergeants and the lieutenants were running. And we all got out, we emptied all the barracks, and the place was burning, and, and we watched it burn, because no fire engines came. And, and we stayed down there on the ground all night, and about 8 o'clock in the morning, when we were ready to go get fed, a, f a single fire engine, Japanese fire engine, came up. The fire was out, and, and just smoldering timbers there. And, and they came, it was like the Tunerval trolley, you know. They had the hand pumps and all that. And that was funny, but later that day, we got on the ship and we uh, came home, and that was the beginning of, of a lot of things. Now, all of that, why it was that important to me, opened up a, a whole new world for me. Because as I said earlier, I never would have gone to college, although I had, you know, I had the uh, ambition. Um, but the GI Bill of Rights uh, came and we got college. And when I got to um, uh, be interviewed, it was, uh, it was just a couple of months later, I started Temple University. And they had classes out in the different high schools, and in the afternoon, um, and I had to go there for an interview. And the the person that was the the principal or the superintendent of that particular Alney High School is where I went. I walk in there and I look at him, and it's my old high school principal, and his name was A. Oswald Mitchener. And I'm stressing Michener because I got to tell you about another Michener that was important in my life. And he looked at me and he said, where'd you go to high school? I said, Ben Franklin. He said, Ben Franklin, what did you have? When did you go? When did, you know? And I said, I was editor of the school paper my last uh, term there. And, and um, he said, oh, I remember, yeah. And anyway, he didn't even look at my credentials. I was in. And so I went to college and six months after I, I started, I got married. We got married early in those days, particularly if we came back from overseas and um, uh, went through college. And I was really starting out to be a reporter. I really liked journalism and I always wrote. I, when I was in, in, in the Philippines, I edited a battalion newspaper in high school. I edited a school paper. And, um, and other organizations, I, I did that kind of little things. But, you know, having gotten married and, and uh, my first daughter was, going, you know, this was when I was in my second year, and my wife was pregnant and all 
had. So I um, had to find a way to get out of college and start making a living. So I transferred to Teachers College, became a teacher, got a job right away, um, 1949. I also I had got got a master's degree. It took me another three years. Got a master's degree in um, guidance and counseling, and I transferred to being a counselor. So I spent. Um, 13 years in the Philadelphia school system. And um, how did I leave teaching to go into politics? Well, we moved to Levittown in 19, my wife and I and our, our oldest daughter moved to Levittown, which was brand new, in 1952. We were able to buy that house with $100 down. If we changed our mind, we got the $100 back. Uh, we settled there with a mortgage. The house cost $10,000, which just uh, recently sold. Uh, my former wife sold that house for $250,000, <laughs> we had paid $10,000 for it. At, at any rate, um, um, I, I was, we were there, we were all brand new in Levittown, uh, or from all over, but there was nothing there. And um, one day a neighbor said to me, uh, there was a meeting uh, to organize a Democratic Party. So I said, uh, I'll go, I have nothing to do. I went to the meeting and there were seven of us there. And the, the old timer who lived in that, that area before us came in to tell us about politics. And um, he said, um, in that area, there was Falls Township, it was a township, it was Levittown, but it was in Falls Township because Levittown was split among four different municipalities. He said, in Falls Township, no Democrat has ever been elected to office, so therefore, um, well, we have a hard time, but we try to get along. And he said, we have an election coming up, this was 1953, we have an election coming up and we need seven people to run for office. And there were seven of us there. So I ran for some nondescript office, I think it was township auditor or something like that. And of course, we lost the primary because the Republicans, they wrote in enough Democrats to beat us in the primary. So that was a lesson I learned uh, two years later. And, and I wasn't really very active. Two years later, 1955, Again, uh, the local committee person came over and asked me to run for township supervisor. I said, well, what is that? What do you have to do? Because I was working in Philadelphia then. And she explained the job to me, how oh, you got three supervisors and they run the township and all. So I said, well, you know, uh, why should I, should I run? I, I really am not interested in running for that, for office. And she said, look, Milton, you can't win. They've never elected a Democrat. But just think, you go back to school and you, you talk about your experience running for office, talk to kids. So I bought that nonsense <laughs> and I let them put my name up. And I had primary opposition and I beat the other guy in the primary and I enjoyed it. And, and I learned how to knock on doors and, and, and I remember the first time I went out knocking on doors. It was in the summertime, it was a hot day it was Sunday, because you know, I was still teaching. And um, I go to Fearless Hills where the steel workers were living. I figured I'd better start there because they're Democrats. And they were brand new too. And I knock on the door, the screen door is closed, but the front door is open and the guy yells, come in. I say, hey, I'm politicking. I'm, I'm coming here to ask for your vote. And he said, come on in. And he's sitting there in his shorts, undershorts, no shirt on, watching a ball game. And he's got a, a, a can of beer, and he says, have a beer. Well, I didn't drink beer or anything else, but I figured if he offers me a beer, I got to take it. I, okay, and I take it, I sip the beer, and, and we talk in politics. And he said, oh, I'll vote for you, Burkus, because uh, you came here. So I went next door, same thing happens. I had to have another beer. By the third place, I was drunk, <laughs> I had to quit. <laughs> So I learned my lesson about that, and I learned how you can take a sip and just hide the rest of the can. <laughs> but at, at any rate, I won the primary, and, and uh, 
I won the, the general election and I was the first Democrat ever elected in that township. And, and it was by knocking on doors and talking to people. I didn't spend, didn't know how to raise money, so I didn't spend much money. And we didn't do much, you didn't do any television in those days. And those that raised money put ads in the newspaper, but we never did that. So it was just knocking on doors and talking to people. And the fact that the steel workers are now moving in because U.S. Steel had just opened a big plant in our township. So and they were all Democrats and they were just moving in and, and I won. So I became a township supervisor. There were two Republicans and my, I was the Democrat. And so they thought, uh, they were thinking this uppity young smart guy just moved there, doesn't know anything, but he's got a big mouth and he's talking too much. And what can we do to control him? This was what my conjecture. <laughs> and they said, let's make him secretary because that pays, see supervisor pays nothing, not even expenses. But secretary, they pay a little bit uh, because they have to write the notes and get them printed and all that. So they said, um, we'd like you to be secretary. And I said, well, what do I have to do? I said, the first thing they said, well, you get $600 a year. And then they told me what I have to do. I said, you know, I'll take that job, but I want 1200 <laughs> And they said they would have given me anything I wanted because they thought that would shut me up because I'd be busy writing the minutes. But it didn't shut me up. And two years later, we elected a second Democrat and we became in control. And I became chairman of the board, which in effect was mayor. And uh, then two years after that, we elected another Democrat. And then we changed the law to we were allowed to change our our township into having five supervisors instead of three, and we elected two more, and we had five supervisors, and that was real my, really my beginning in in politics. I kept teaching until 1962. In 61, uh, let me backtrack a minute. 1960. Um, of course, I was a supervisor, and I was, in my, uh, I was finishing up my first term. There were six-year terms, and um, uh, Kennedy was running for president, and Kennedy had a uh, big rally in Levittown, and I was feuding, as we always do, well, us young guys, they called us the Young Turks. We were feuding with the county chairman who was, you know, from Doylestown, the other end of the county, and, and um, he was so mad at us that he wouldn't let any of us on the platform. But I was, you know, I was a supervisor and my police were out there. So I just stood with my police. I got closer to Kennedy than anybody else did. But the point of that story is this. James Michener, you know who James Michener was. James Michener was appointed by the Kennedy people to organize in Bucks County those dissident Democrats who were feuding with the chairman and any Republicans who might want to vote for Kennedy, particularly among the Catholic population, and any independents who might want to vote for Kennedy. So he organized a group, uh, um, I don't know, he called it the Independents or something like that, uh, for Kennedy. And he talked to me one day, and I got to tell you how this happened. Um, he. His closest friend in Bucks County was a man named Herman Silverman. Herman was the founder and president of Sylvan Pools, which was a nationwide pool company. Herman and I grew up together in Strawberry Mansion. He lived next door to me. His brother Izzy, who then became Ira when he made money, <laughs> his brother Izzy was one of my closest friends. And, and Herman was a couple years older than me. And, uh, but Herman from Strawberry Mansion went to school in Doylestown, National Farm School, and he opened a, a business doing uh, uh, landscaping. And then he went into the pool business and he, he jumped and he, he built that business up so big. And by, by some coincidence, Michener and he became great friends. Uh, now Michener was wor working in New, New York then at the publishing company. He was an editor. 
but he would visit Bucks County every weekend because he grew up there and, and his two aunts still lived there. And, and um, he got to the point where uh, he met Herman and they become good friends and every time he'd come to Bucks County, he'd sleep at Herman's house. And, and so they were real tight. And so I conjectured, I didn't find this out till years later, that uh, when uh, Michener mentioned that he was putting this committee together, Herman said, get hold of Milt Berkus. And um, uh, so he did. And he called me and we met uh, with a bunch of other people. And he asked me to be one of his vice president, vice chairmen. He appointed three vice chairmen to handle different, one for the Democrats, one for the Republicans, one for the Independents. And, and that's how I got to know Michener. Now, in 1962, that was two years later, he called me one day and he said, Milt, come on up here, I want to talk to you. He lived up above the last town near Pipersville. And um, so I was sure, and oh, there was snow on the ground and all that, but I figured I'll drive up. And I went with a friend of mine, Jack Ford, and um, we're sitting there talking and uh, he got right to the point, which is the way he was. Um, he said, Milt, I want to run for Congress, and I want to run this year. What do you think? And I said, well, Mitch, this is a tough year to run. Kennedy won in 1960, and traditionally, in the off-year election, the party that's against the president wins seats, and it'll be tougher for this year. Why don't you wait till 64? And he says, I can't wait till 64. I made my plans for 62. I've that's the way he was. He did everything in advance. He, he cleared his calendar so he'd be able to campaign. And, and uh, he had it in mind. And then he popped the question to me. He said, I want you to be my campaign manager. Uh, he said, I'll pay you what you get, you're getting from teaching, from the school job. You'll have to get a leave of absence because I want you full time. And um, uh, I said, uh, took me three seconds to say yes. I mean, to work with him. So I was really up and, and I figured that the school would give me a leave of absence because the opportunity to work with Michener and then relay that experience to kids I was working with. So I went into school the next day and the principal said, oh, we can't give you any, any leave of absence for political things, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I peeled over his head and the next day I got a call. Um, we can't do that, Mr. Berkus. If you want to, uh, we won't give you a leave of absence. So I said, well, I quit. And I sent him a letter of resignation and um, went to work for Michener. And I worked for him for nine months. And he's a great guy to work for. I really learned a lot from him. Uh, and then when that, cam that campaign was a great campaign. I got some great stories about that, which, um, I'll tell you about, let me tell you one of them. Um, one, I, we had an office in, in uh, Doylestown. There were only two people that worked with the campaign, me and the secretary. Uh, he didn't hire anybody else. So, but we had a lot of volunteers. And these two, I'm in the office in Doylestown. We had an office in Allentown also because the district included Lehigh County. So these two beautiful young girls walk in. I mean, they were gorgeous and young, and um, they say, is Mr. Michener here? And I said, no, what can I do for you? I'm his campaign manager. She said, well, we'd like to help you. And I said, well, yeah, give me your name and address. And I wrote down, and one was named Lindbergh, and it was Charles Lindbergh's daughter. And the other was named Morrow. Now, her mother was an ambassador to England or something. And these two kids were in, high, in college and they wanted to work for Michener. So we put him right to work. Every place he went to make a speech, he'd introduce <laughs> Lindbergh and Morrow. And, and, and it really was, was great. And uh, every place we went, people would come with their books to get an autograph. And they'd ask him questions about the book, so not about running for office. And um, 
we uh, one time one time uh, uh, Maury met her, his wife, and she was she was a doll. They're both dead, incidentally now. But um, Mari uh, came to me and said, "How's the fundraising going?" I said, "Well, you know, here and there." And um, uh, he says, "She says to me, how about?" Um, she gave me the name, and it'll come to me soon, of uh, the head guy at the pub Random House at that time, Bennett Surf, C E R F, and Bennett Surf was his Mitchner's contact there, and every time Mitchner wrote a book that they printed, Bennett Surf made a lot of money, so, as did Random House. So I, she gives me his private number, and I call Bennett Surf up. And I said, uh, Mr. Surf, you know, I'm, uh, I told him who I was, and I said, uh, you know, uh, Mari said you were going to send us a contribution. And he said, no way, I'm not going to send you a contribution. I said, well, why not? I said it that way, and he said, because if he starts in politics, he's not going to write any books, and I'm not going to make any money. <laughs> and, and so I really tore into him, and, and we had a really interesting conversation. And I went back and I told Mari, and about a week later we got a check for him for $100. <laughs> he was making thousands <laughs> on Mitchin's books, and, and that, uh, anyway. Um, so when that was over, uh, I worked for him, as I said, for nine months, and Michener lost, and we really, we really figured that it's the Bennett Surf thing that beat him. People who loved him for his books didn't want him to stop writing, and and they told us that they come to say, "Oh, will he still write?" Oh, yeah, he'll still write, but they knew that a congressman wouldn't have time to write much except through ghosts. And it was interesting because he still was doing, uh, while he was campaigning, he was catching up on a couple things and he had one of our volunteers who, who he assigned to do some research for him. And that's the way he worked. Uh, but I'll tell you about that later. Anyway, the campaign was over and we had lost, not by much, by about 13,000 we had been behind 24,000, there were 24,000 more Republicans than Democrats, so we had cut into it a little bit. And um, in 1961, my term came up, let me see, uh, yeah, 61, I'd already been re-elected to township supervisor, I still had six years to go. So I went back down to the school system and I applied to be reinstated. Well, they offered me a job as a counselor and uh, in another school, which was okay, I would go any place, but um, I would have to start at a beginner's salary. And just for a year, I would, I would get the beginner's salary. So I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, we have to punish you for quitting. <laughs> so I said, well, I don't have to come back, and I didn't. And, and so... I just never went back to teaching except for a short period of time when I taught at Temple University, and that was a different thing. I was an adjunct instructor there for five years. But at any rate, um, I had to find something to do, and uh, a local real estate uh, broker offered me a job, and I would work for him. And, just, and I really wasn't up to doing that because I was going to be dealing with them. They were developing. and. And I didn't want to get into that. And I had another uh, uh, six years to go, or five years to go, as a township supervisor. Well, it was four, actually four years to go. But um, suddenly our, our acting township manager died. And the other members of the board, the other four, came to me and said, Milt, why don't you take that job? And I said, well, the law says that you can't be a township manager with that title and be a township supervisor. And so then we started kicking that around and they said, somebody said, real smart, well, we'll appoint you as township administrator. And that worked. It was all the duties of the township manager, but I wasn't called the manager. I was called the administrator. And so I became the township administrator until um, and that was a good job, I loved that. But until um, uh, 1966, 
when the reapportionment created the legislative district. And, and I ran for, I said, this is my seat. And Gallagher supported me and the party supported me down there, although the county chairman was still kind of mad at me. And, um, oh, oh, wait a minute, we had made up with the county chairman. Uh, what happened was he was uh, indicted for, um, for, for macing, M-A-C-I-N-G, that's hitting workers, employees, for contributions, and he was uh, hitting um, uh, state workers who work for a highway department uh, for contributions to, uh, he, was, he had been county commissioner uh, for contributions to the party, and so they, they found out about it, and they indicted him, and it didn't hurt that the district attorney was also the Republican county chairman, and <laughs> you see, that kind of politics got into it. And he went through a whole week. I was up there every day of the week. And Michener was there every day. And we brought in um, uh, a guy from Pittsburgh that was running for a governor. And he came there to testify and for, and Mitchell came and testified. And, and I would have t testified, uh, but they, they never called me. But we supported him. At the end of the week, um, he was acquitted. And, um, uh, but he was really bitter. And it was um, uh, the following year, it was uh, 1963, that was in uh, early 63. And that year, uh, we were running county commissioner candidates. And the people who were running the party with, Johnny Welsh was the county chairman, who later became a good friend of mine. But the people that were running the party came up with the idea that we ought to run two new young people who are in township office and who are bright and, and who can do things. And um, uh, they, they pushed uh, for me and, and Walter Farley, who was the supervisor in Middletown, uh, to go on the ticket. Well, Welsh didn't want either of us, but he finally accepted Farley, but he said, ah, that, Burkus, that, blah, blah. Anyway, <laughs> we were in the meeting, and, and they, would, they cornered Welsh, the, the other people that run the party, so you've got to get over it, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, uh, he said, well, I don't know that much about him. And then they, they took out Michener's book. Michener wrote a book after the Kennedy campaign. He called it Report of the County Chairman. He was county chairman of this group that he started, this independent organization. And on one page of that book, I should have brought it with me and showed it to you. He wrote, he was, had this meeting with all these people and this bright young man with the quickest mind I ever met named Milton Burkus, a young school teacher out of Philadelphia. He got up and he made such great, you know, anyway. So, from then on, I want to tell you that every time I ran for office, I used, and this is what James Michener said about me, and it's on page 142 of the book, go look at it. But, but at, at any rate, we got to this 63, um, uh, and so they finally convinced him, they, they showed him what Michener said, and they convinced him to support me for county, county commissioner. And so the two of us ran, and we were close friends, and we ran closely together, and I lost by 500 votes. So that was my first loss, and only loss. Uh, so I, I went back to being township administrator, and then the, the state rep job opened up. And I said, that's my job. Uh, I had gotten, and Welsh had a, uh, did a, um, he had a habit. When a person ran for county office, and they knew he couldn't win, they would um, give him something, uh, some other job. So he got me elected as a delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 1964 in Atlantic City, which was the first convention I ever went to. Subsequently, I went to six conventions, and I loved them. That was fun. But at any rate, I ran for the, uh, for the, the State House, won the primary easily. Um, in the general, I had a lawyer running against me, um, 
a really nice guy. He called me up one day, Milt, I want to talk to you. And, and he said, uh, I want to run a clean campaign, Milt. Do you pledge to do the same thing? I said, of course. I didn't even know the guy, so I didn't know any dirt about him. I said, of course. You want to clean? I'll be clean. We'll run a clean. Let's see how it goes. He was afraid because he had a girlfriend. <laughs> you, know, you know, that always comes up. And, but I didn't know about it. No, I wouldn't have used it anyhow. It was ridiculous. Because in those days, it was different from these days. These days, they use everything. So anyway, I beat him by 2,700 votes, and that was a good, solid victory. Um, and that was my first election to the State House. The next election, I, lost, I won by 500. The following election, I won by 1,000. The next election, I won by 270. And at that point, I said, you know, maybe I better do something else. But um, uh, I want to talk later about my, my time in the House, but finish out my career business. Um, uh, Milton Schaff was running for, for governor, and he ran twice in the primaries. Bob Casey um, was the endorsed candidate. I was elected county chairman in 1968. And so as county chairman, I supported Casey, although I liked Chap, and I knew him. Uh, I'd gotten acquainted with him at the 64 convention, and, um, and I knew him well. And he called me up one day and, and said, I understand, Milt, that, that you've got to support uh, Casey, but take it easy on me. <laughs> so I said, don't worry, Milt. And, and what I did for Casey, I, I was his advance man in the eastern part of the state. But at the same time, I was also running for state rep. And he said to me at the end of the primary, in fact, it was the last dinner before the primary, he was in Doylestown. He said to me when he offered me this job, being his advance man for the whole state, I said, I can't do that because I'm running. He said, I thought about that. And he said, I'll come into your district five times during the campaign. Five times, and we'll get big crowds because he thought he was going to win the primary. And, and so I said, OK, I'll do it. But he lost the primary. Schaap beat him. And then that was 66, I guess. And Schaap lost the general election to uh, Ray Schaefer, uh, the Republican. And then in 70, it was the same thing. Schaap filed and Casey filed. Casey was endorsed. I supported Casey. Schaap won again. and. Um, uh, but, you know, I sent him congratulations, and I was um, uh, still uh, very close to him. And um, so, go up to 70, 74, and Schaap was now serving his second, uh, was, was, no, no, he, in 78 he was elected to a second term. In 78, no, I got my... 70, it must have been 76. So, it may have been 74. Anyway, whatever. When he was elected to his second term, uh, and I had worked for him after the pr uh, primary, and I really hustled, and we won big in Bucks County, 12 by 12,000 votes. It's still a Republican county. And um, I saw him on a campaign trail, and he said to me, uh, Milk, what are you going to do? Are you gonna and, and I had already said that I'm not going to run for re-election. But he offered me a job. He said, I want you in the administration. And I said, well, that's great. Uh, you know, I'd love to do that. And by doing that, I, you know, uh, so when the, uh, he was sworn in, and in February, I went before the, uh, uh, Dick Duran, who was the, uh, uh, his assistant, his executive assistant, and we talked about a job, and because I had been involved in the legislature, which I want to tell you about later, but in the drug and alcohol field, he said, how about we appoint you as Deputy Secretary of Health, and your duties would be to oversee legislation for the health department, mainly for drug and alcohol abuse, and the uh, uh, welfare department. You'd work with both secretaries, but you had to be housed in one of them, so we'll appoint you Deputy Secretary of Health. So I said, 
well, that's fine. What would the salary be? And he told me something. I said, no, wait a minute. I want $40,000 at that time, you know, and the, say, the other secretaries were getting that and deputies. And he said, well, we can bring in at 39. So I said, okay, I'll make a deal. So I went to work for him. Of course, you know, that enhanced my, but my pension eventually because that was twice what we were making as legislators. At any rate, um, I went to work for the health department and I, I was working on, on health issues and welfare issues. And Terry Delmuth, who was the governor's special assistant for human services and a great guy, he was done with, tired of uh, uh, public service and, and he really wanted to turn to something else. And he told the governor he was going to resign. This was about six months into his uh, second term. And the governor says, well, you can't quit until you find a replacement. And Terry came to see me and asked me how I would like that job. And I said, I'd love it. The job was a deputy assistant governor for human services, which was right up my alley, everything I'd been trained to do all my life. And um, so I was hired as, uh, in that position as um, assistant governor for, assistant to the governor for human services. And I served there until 1978 when his term expired. And um, that's, it must have been 74 was the election, or 73, 74. And um, after that, uh, I, I submitted my resignation because Thornburg was elected and he wasn't going to keep me on. I knew that. And, and I, I looked around for maybe another position in government. But it was obvious that Thornburg was going to make big changes and, and it was only Republicans who were going to get appointed to good jobs. Uh, so one day I'm reading the Philadelphia Inquirer and I see an ad in the paper. This is funny. And the ad was for, they were looking for an executive director of a brand new social service agency that worked with inmates at a city jail system, helping them turn their lives around. The agency, agency was called OAR, which stood for Offender Aid and Restoration. And this was one of nine such agencies in, in nine different states. But I would run the Philadelphia uh, agency. And I applied for it, and the salary was very low. But I was already drawing my, I, I mean, I was going to draw my pension. Um, I was old enough then to draw my pension. So uh, I figured I, I don't care about the salary now because, of the, you know, I've got a backup. Uh, so I took the job. I stayed there 18 years. It was the job I held for more than any other job I ever had. And we did build a good agency. We worked with inmates of the city jail. We, we ran uh, work programs for them inside the jail and how to, we had to teach them basic things like, like how to dress when you go apply for a job and how to talk and, and we had to teach them how to write a, a, an app, fill out an application, write a letter and things like that. And people don't understand that most of the prisoners in the city jail system are not people that have been convicted but they're people that can, can't make bail. And they're in there because they couldn't come up with a hundred bucks for bail. So, you know, they're, they're very, you know, the class of people. Is, well, they've committed a crime, but they haven't been convicted yet. And so we worked with them for 18 years, different groups, and we had a pretty good thing going. Uh, as part of that, at a time I was appointed personally, but, you know, because of the agency, as the um, monitor at the juvenile detention facility, which is called the Youth Study Center. Uh, and um, the juvenile defense, uh, the ju juvenile um, uh, uh, institution was um, under fire for terrible conditions. And they went to court, and a, a group went to court, and they got a court order listing 40 different things that had to be done to improve and my job was to oversee those 40 things and make sure that 
listening to what the court said and to report back to, the, it was a federal court incidentally, to report back to the federal judge uh, each month as the progress on, on that. And I loved that. I, you know, I did that just, you know, I'd go there one or two days a week, but I was still running the agency and, and I was able to get some things done. But, you know, that was a long time ago. And even then, even then, the conditions at the Youth Study Center were horrible. And everybody talked about replacing it, tearing it down, building a new one, but nobody did anything. And uh, and I, every time I went to the judge, I said, "You got to get a new building there." So um, eventually, the the judge died, and they came to be in compliance, and uh, and I had a heart attack, and so I had to leave. Uh, I, I came back to the job, but um, from there it kind of went down. We still work with inmates, but they had other programs doing it. And uh, when Rendell was elected mayor, and Rendell was a good friend of mine, he had to cut a lot of things. And we were getting $175,000 a year from the city, plus other funds which I raised. And he had to cut that program. And I got mad because he didn't talk to me about it, but I, I agreed that he had to cut it. And I got other funds, mostly from the court, to continue on for a few more years, although I had to lay off a lot of staff. And uh, eventually the money ran out and I left it and I retired. So that was my working days. Well, what a very interesting <laughs> career in life <laughs> you've had. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Well, I would like to go back just a little bit to um, your your time in the house. Okay. okay. Um, could you describe the district a little bit more? You talked about um, the some of Levittown being mm -hmm. one of the areas. Part of Levittown. Right. Yeah. So can you t talk about the area, the people, where they were, right. Right. their issues? The district consisted of a part of Levittown that was in the township of Falls, Falls Township. Uh, Levittown was really divided into four different townships and no place was it called Levittown except in the post office. It was a postal address. Uh, we were Falls Township or Bristol Township, which this is, or, or uh, Middletown Township or Tullytown Borough. So we, we consisted of Falls Township and Tullytown Borough and Bristol Borough and two wards out of Gallagher's district in Bristol Township. and. The, the overwhelming number of people were steel workers who worked for United States Steel. There was, in addition to Levittown, there was a new community built called Fearless Hills, and they were all steel workers. And eventually, you know, it turned around. And there were some newer houses built and all that. And so it became an overwhelmingly democratic district. And um, uh, it, it really reflected my, my own views, uh, which were very liberal. And so, so we, uh, early on, I was pro-choice and I was anti-gun and <laughs> all of those good things. Uh, that's the way that the district was. But mainly in Bristol Borough, there were, they were very solidly Democrat, but it had been Republican because the the king of Bristol Borough, who never held office in Bristol, but he has a state senator named Joe Grundy, and Joe Grundy owned the local mill, and and they, uh, everybody in Bristol had worked for the mill. By the time I came on the scene, the mill was going down. Grundy was no longer a senator; he was ninety years old, and I remember this interesting. And everybody talked about him, but I've never met him. One day, a uh, a Republican who was who became friendly with me and was friendly w with everybody, the, particularly the people who wanted to convert Folsington, which was where our, ca our township seat was. It was an old community. They wanted to make a, um, uh, a, a, a colonial area community out of it. And um, her name was uh, Hutton. And she, she said to me, she said, have you ever met the senator? And I said, no, I never have, I'd love to. And she said, well, come on with me, up in the car, and we drove to 
his, his house in Bristol. It was a big house on the river. She knocked on the door and they knew her. And well, the senator's up in his study. And we went up and we stood there and he was hunched over a table and didn't lift his head. He stood there and then finally, uh, Ann, Ann Hawks Hutton was her name. She said, um, Senator, I want you to meet a uh, young fellow who's the new supervisor in um, Falls Township. And without lifting his head, he said, he was Quaker, he said, be ye a Republican? And I said, no, I'm a Democrat. Never lifted his head, never said another word, and then grabbed me by the arm and said, let's go. <laughs> So that was my first experience with it. But despite that, Bristol Township turned out to be a democratic area. It was very important to me personally. Uh, whenever I'd have, I'd have trouble in my hometown because I was county chairman and, and other reasons, uh, or we had to do things that not everybody thought was popular, um, the uh, Bristol people would bail me out. And, and there's a funny story about Bristol. Well, they were, and probably still are, uh, inhabited by the Irish and the Italians, who never saw eye to eye. But you see, they both could support me. They, they would fight each other. But I was Jewish, so I didn't fit into either side. <laughs> and they supported me from both sides. But I have to go to both clubs. I'd have to go to St. Anne's, and I'd have to go to uh, uh, the Mutual Aid Society, the Fifth Ward. One was Irish, one was Italian. You but I enjoyed it. Huh? Not in the same night, I hope. Well, <laughs> it was not the same night because they kept me there a long time when I went. So, actually, um, being Jewish helped you then? It helped me in Bristol. Did not help me in the old part of town. It helped me in um, uh, Levittown. Uh, did not help me in Fearless Hills. But it, there was never any open hostility. Uh, my first election, they, they didn't really know who a Jew was. They didn't know who a Democrat was. So, you know, <clears throat> it was really strange. But uh, after that, uh, uh, it was, you know, it, it was not a problem. Could you describe your first swearing in in yeah, the House of Representatives? Yeah, that was fun. Um, I was sworn in and I'm sitting at my seat and we're going through the whole session. And uh, <clears throat> Jim Gallagher had arranged for me to have a a reception over in the Penn Harris Hotel. So, you know, I was anxious to get over there because people were coming up from Bucks County. And um, I'm sitting in a way back seat next to the last row, and the Speaker of the House, Ken Lee, says the chair recognizes the gentleman from Bucks, Mr. Burks. And um, I looked up. I said to Jane Alexander, who was sitting next to me, so what's he calling me for? And she said, well, you're supposed to do something. You want to make a speech or something? I said, no, I don't want to make a speech. I just got here. And, and she says, well, they're calling you to do something. And then I, as an aide comes running up to me and hands me a slip of paper. So I forgot I should have handed you this before. I was to make the German motion. So they were calling on a brand new guy and I was B, so I was first in line to make the adjournment motion. So I read it from, oh, before that, while Ken Lee was trying to figure out, he said, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe, maybe it's the gentleman from Burke's Mr. Box. <laughs> and we had a big laugh about that. And then he handed me the slip and I got up and I made the motion and everybody applauded. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first day. <laughs> and then the parties began. Well, this was another interesting. Gallagher, as you know, Gallagher was my best friend, my dearest friend, and he taught me everything I knew. But he was also a big drinker, and everybody knew that. And he got one of his friends to set up the party. And they rented the largest reception room in the Panaris Hotel, which is usually reserved for the Speaker of the House. And and was on the first floor, and everybody coming in to go to the other parties had to go past mine, and they all thought it was Herb Feynman's party <laughs> reception. They all came in, and they're looking around, and I go over and shake hands with them. 
you're, who are you, <laughs> Bucks County, Democrat? Uh, you know, and they were really looking for her, but was in some other room. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of people go through there, a lot of beer, a lot of booze, <laughs> and we had a big bill, but uh, that was really interesting. And my father, he, he had a ball. He was running around, that's my son, that's my son. <laughs> And so, did you have a relationship with Mr. Feynman since you've mentioned him? Feynman was very good to me. Uh, I thought he was, he was the smartest guy I knew. He did more for the legislature in the years he was speaker, and before that he was uh, the majority leader, than anybody ever did. Uh, Leroy Irvis picked up on it, and so did um, Ryan. Uh, and they improved everything that Herb done. But when I first went into the legislature, we didn't have an office. I said to Gallagher, well, where do I work? And he said, you work out there on the uh, Florida House at your desk. I said, no. Well, where's the telephone? Well, there's telephone booths there. And you go up there and uh, you wait in line and you use the telephone booth. And I said, well, how about if I want to get a letter written to my constituents? Well, you get in line at the, the secretary's pool. Well, and that's the way it was. The only people that had offices were the, the um, committee chairs and the officers of each, uh, each um, uh, caucus. Herb Feynman did away with that. We, in our second term, we all got offices, although we shared, we shared secretaries but at least we had an office to work in. And in the third term, we didn't have to share the office, we got our own, we had phones, and, and whatever other equipment they had in those days. I mean, that was before the computer was really big. And um, he did all that, and Herb, Herb brought that out of the uh, old, and old ages and into the modern ages. And he made that a uh, really functioning legislature. And, and we also met more, and um, uh, that we did more, and, and, and we discussed more. We had caucuses and, and discussed everything that was going on and what would be coming up on the agenda and things like that. So Herb was very good. Unfortunately, he got into trouble, which to this day, I believe, was not his fault. But he took the fall for it and he served 11 months at the Allenwood. That really changed his whole, you know, he never went back to public office. Although I used to meet with him when I was running my agency in Philadelphia. Uh, Jerry Kaufman, who was also an ex-legislator by that time, but was working and living in Philadelphia, although he represented a district in Pittsburgh originally. Uh, Jerry and I would call Herb and we'd have lunch with him every once a month or so and just discuss old times and things. But uh, in the final analysis, I suppose they trouble he got into might override everything he did, but everything he did was great. Really brought us up to modern times. And, and he was a good liberal, and he supported all the liberal causes, and he showed it. He was not afraid. He was a good leader. Well, they also call this time the era of professionalism. And um, they were moving from a part-time legislature to a full-time legislature. That's right. So you were a full-time legislator? Full-time, right from the beginning. Full-time, and I never had another job. I, you know, we, we weren't getting paid much. Uh, after, I think it was 7,500 a year, something like that, and no expenses. So Gallagher and I chipped in and we, we rented a small office, and it was actually in my district, it was close to his, and, and the two of us paid for it ourselves, and we paid our telephone bill ourselves. But uh, I was a small home office. And then after that, of course, uh, it got better. Yeah. yeah. Most people had their district offices in their other businesses. Yeah, yeah. And so. I didn't have another, either did Gallagher. He was a full-time legislator. I just never sought another job. My wife worked, and, and Gallagher's wife worked, and uh, uh, we made do with uh, what we had. Was it difficult serving um, this county, this district, in relation to where it was from Harrisburg? Did you commute every day? I, well, <clears throat> no. Uh, 
Gallagher and I would drive together, and um, he had been in the habit of renting a room at the um, Penn Harris Hotel because he was there before me for several years. And this room was as big as a closet. It had a bed and nothing else, and a bathroom down a hall and whatever. But that that's, I said, Jim, you, you know, you, you got to get bigger space than that. So he and I rented an apartment. I remember it was at the, um, it's that real cheap uh, motel that was uh, in town. It, w it was just on the outskirts of town. They're still in business, but they're the cheapest hotel you can get. I forget its name. And we, we'd rent a room there, and um, uh, what the, they would do, we'd rent it in one person's name. And either me or Jim, and but they had two beds, and um, you would pay for by the number of beds you used, one or two. So in the morning we'd make one bed up, <laughs> and we'd pay for one bed, <laughs> and and uh, no, no, nobody cared. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> but then after that, uh, it got so that we rented a, a larger space, an apartment, and we had like. Four people in there: uh, Bill Shane, Jerry Kaufman, uh, and uh, two aides. At one time, we had six people. Some sleeping on in, uh, on the floor, and uh, they brought the sleeping bags with them. The aides did. We had beds, <laughs> but uh, uh, we did that, and, and that's what we did afterwards. We'd rent. When I went into the governor's office, I rented my own apartment, and it was on Front Street, two blocks from the office. And that was um, because then, see, in the legislature we'd stay there three days, sometimes four, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, sometimes we'd be able to leave Wednesday night, but usually we'd have committee meetings or something else and we'd stay over till Thursday. And, uh, and so, you know, it, was, it paid us to rent, rent a place and share the cost. Um, but I did go home. Sometimes I went to home and came back and was really home. I went to Doylestown to conduct a meeting. I was still county chairman. And if I had to go down for some meeting on Monday night or Tuesday night or even Wednesday night, I would go down. And Jim would go, go with me sometimes. Otherwise, I'd drive myself and then come back the same night. Uh, sometimes I would go home to sleep and then come back, back the next morning. But usually I'd go back the same night. So. I did that uh, for two years. Yeah. Well, we had noticed whenever we were looking at your your legislation that you and Mr. Gallagher sponsored and co-sponsored a lot of each yeah. other's legislation. Yeah. yeah. Is that because of your relationship, or it, it was it our it was our relationship, but also our interest? <clears throat> I was naturally interested in education, and um, Jim was the chairman of the ed education committee. Got to t should I tell you how he became chairman? Sure. Okay. Again, my first day in Harrisburg, uh, there's a caucus of the whole new guys, and they introduced the new guys. And I'm standing in the back because the seats were taken, and so you, you have to stand in the back. And they're electing officers. Now, that's also always pro forma. They present a slate. They all get elected. Jim comes back to me and says, no, nominate me for secretary. I said, how do I do that, Jim? Raise your hand and say you want to nominate me for secretary. So I raised my hand. Prendergast, Jim Prendergast, who was from uh, Northampton County, he was presiding because uh, the others were running for offices. So he was presiding, and they had the slate. And I said, I want to make a nomination. He said, you can't do that. I said, well, why not? <laughs> You know, democracy. And people are yelling and boo, and, and some are laughing. They're laughing at me, this guy that just came here. And, and so I say, I want to nominate Jim Gallagher for secretary. And he bangs the gavel. Well, I say, I can't accept that nomination. And people are screaming. And, and Joe Wargo, who was the, the designated nominee, and Joe was a nice guy, he had one leg. And, and uh, he comes hobbling over to me on his crutches. And I said, 
talk to Jim. He told me to do it. <laughs> so they, they got Jim, took him outside. They, went in, they, they called a recess, took him outside. Jim said, I want to be chairman of the education committee. Came back into me, whispered, withdraw the nomination. I raised my hand, I withdraw the nomination. Everybody clapped and laughed. And Jim became secretary of the education committee. Turned out to be a great secretary. He was excellent. The guy never went to college. He was a bus, bus mechanic when we ran him for the legislature. Never went to college, but he was responsible for the community college system, the state, uh, state uh, colleges that are state related. Uh, did many things because he had a good staff to work with, but, but he, he fought the fight. I got involved in drug and alcohol issues when, when a guy walked into my office one day and, and back in the district that I was paying for, Jim and I, he walked in and he said um, to, uh, I think at that time my, my wife was, was putting in time as secretary or a receptionist and he said to her, um, uh, I want to talk to one of the legislators. Well, who do you want to talk to? Uh, Gallagher's not here. Well, who's the other guy? And she said, Berkus. Ber Berkus. Ber yeah, I want to talk to him. The guy was, first of all, he was black. Secondly, he was dressed in such dungarees that fell off of him and dirty clothes, and his hair was all mussed up, and he had mud on his face like he was a, a um, street person. So anyway, my wife calls me, and I call him into the office, I sit there, what, what do you want? And he says, he tells me this story, first of all he introduces himself, his name was Jack Hobson, and he was a drug agent for the state of Pennsylvania. Now at that time they had, what he was doing that day, why he was dressed like that, he was undercover, he was undercover. They had 27 drug agents that worked independently as, as undercover, didn't wear uniforms, didn't carry guns, but they, they, they were very effective because they, some of them were street people themselves and, and they knew, knew the streets and knew they, they could work. And what happened was that Ray Schaefer, when he got elected governor, wanted to disband that unit of 27 people who had a great record of bringing in uh, uh, dealers. Um, and, and turn the job over to the state police. Well, the state police are uniform people. They couldn't do what these guys were doing. And he laid this whole all out to me and that they're gonna fire us and blah, 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 and what we're doing. He had statistics as to how many people they had arrested and how they work. And I said, that's crazy to do away with a unit that's there, whatever it is. And so I, you know, I talked to Gallagher about it and we talked to Feynman and, um, um, Ray Schaefer hesitated in, in putting forth his um, legislation and for some reason uh, it didn't move forward until the end of the term uh, and we had enough votes to defeat that legislation. But um, uh, I said to Herb, I said, Herb, what you got to do is have a special committee to work on this problem. And he says, you know, we don't like to appoint special committees. We really, the, the tradition is to turn the problem over to the health committee because it's, you know, or, or the um, uh, welfare or, or somebody. And, and it was a criminal justice problem, so turn it over to the attorney general. But I said, look, turn, we can, we can bring out a lot of interest in this problem and come up with new legislation and um, do a lot of things. So in the second term, when Herb, um, Herb was, uh, uh, oh, Herb became a speaker um, in the second term, he appointed me as chairman of the special committee on, on narcotics. Well, that was strange because no, no second term would get to be a chairman of a committee. And uh, we had different legislators that wanted that job, but Herb stuck with me, and I was chairman, and 
that led, the, led me to my interest in drug and alcohol. It took us about four or five years to finally get the, the bill passed and signed into law by Governor Schapp. But that was after we had public hearings. We traveled to different states to see what they were doing. And the committee really worked hard. So that's why every drug bill I had, Gallagher was on, and I was on his education bills because that was still my interest. I got to tell you about a thing we did that was never done in the legislature and hasn't been done since. When I was doing hearings, uh, public hearings in different places, for, for, and we were writing a new drug and alcohol control bill. That's what we were doing. And when we were doing hearings, we would go to different places. But then I got a call from the people at um, WHYY, um, and they wanted to know if I'd be, uh, if I'd object if public radio televised one of your hearings. And I said, I'd love it. And I talked to Herb, and he said, set it up. So we set up the hearing in your, your building, the museum uh, mm -hmm. there. And they brought in all their equipment. They had big uh, trailers outside and everything. And they, they were going to spend the whole day with us. And we planned a whole day of public hearings. And it was on television. And, and um, uh, well, it sobered up some of our guys because, oh, they came in dressed up in ties. And everybody wanted to sit next to me because they knew as chairman I'd be, you know, so, but I had to save a seat for Feynman, and I had Gallagher in the other seat, and uh, I made a mistake of letting them uh, take a break for dinner, and they came back, and some of them had drank a little too much. <laughs> but it was okay. They all behaved very well, and Jim, of course, knew to behave himself. And um, that was, a, a, they, they taped the whole day. They didn't show the whole day, but they taped the whole day. And uh, it was a really good year. I brought in a guy from, I shouldn't call him a guy, I'm sorry, he's a priest. I brought in this priest from New York who they called the junkie priest because he worked on the Bowery with drug addicts. And that was his calling. And we had gone up there to see him and I talked him up there and I brought him in to testify. And he was the main guy to testify because, you know, with that title of the junkie priest, he got all the credit and all, all the, and, uh, but it was good. Never been done since. They've, they've, they've never uh, invest, invested so much money in doing something we did, and there were a lot of good things that were done. Just and just for the record, that those were the Pennsylvania Drug and Alcohol Control Acts, Act sixty three and sixty four, uh, exactly. nineteen seventy two. Exactly. Yeah. And you were the prime. Sponsor. I was the prime sponsor. Okay. I had a fight about that too. I I worked, and, and it was really a, the staff, you know. I had a good staff, and they they did all the legal work because I didn't know anything about the law. But um, I, we had general ideas, and one of the things we did, by definition, we defined that drug abuse and alcohol abuse were health problems, not criminal justice problems. So that opened up the the state to get millions of dollars of federal money for health treatment programs. And that's what our, our bill basically did, set up treatment programs all over the state. And every program that's in existence today, Abraxas, Alinari, and, and uh, two or three Philadelphia programs, and today incorporated here in Bucks County, that's when they were formed. And they're still operating today. There's dozens and dozens of them that are still operating. Is there any other legislation that you would like to talk about? I, I also instituted a crime victims compensation bill. Uh, I worked hard on that and, and uh, it came about f through a constituent. Uh, Joyce Sebular was her name. God, how I can remember that. <laughs> it just came to me. I haven't been able to think of it for years. But Joyce lived in Fairless Hills and and she was uh, accosted by a neighbor, a young neighbor, who hit her over the head with a hammer, intending to rape her. And of course she screamed, and um, he ran. 
and of course he was caught. And um, Joyce had to go to the hospital, was in the hospital for months and months and months, and under treatment for years because you know, she, she had a concussion and then that developed other brain problems, hear, um, uh, remembering pr memory problems, etc. This kid got uh, six months in jail and was out on the street and doing whatever it was he was doing, although he didn't get into any more trouble. Uh, anyhow, um, she came to me and I said, well, we've got to do something about that. And so I, together with our staff, our lawyers, we put together the Crime Victims Compensation Act. I was the principal sponsor and Bill Eckensberger whose name I haven't said for a long time. He was the second sponsor to me. He was a co-sponsor. And we got the bill through, we got it up, and we couldn't, we couldn't get it reported out. The Republicans controlled the House, and they had the speaker. It was Kenley speaker? I don't know. Lee Donaldson may have been. No, Butera. Bob Butera was majority leader. And, and he controlled the thing. So every day I would talk to him, and he said, oh, we're thinking about him, Milt, we're thinking, and never reported the bill out because those two Democrats were principal sponsors. Came to the last day of the session, and you know what happens on the last day. They pass 150 bills, and they're running bills through back and forth, back to the Senate and back. And, and I grabbed Bob Butera early. I said, Bob, you gotta get this bill out for me. And Bob was a nice guy. We always got along well. I said, Milt, I'll do it. It's, uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll find out where it is, what committee. I, I'll tell them what committee. So it comes at noon, it's not out. I said, Bob, where's the bill? Oh, yeah, I'll get it, Milt. We've got a lot to do here. Six o'clock comes, it's still not out. And they got to adjourn at 12. That's what the law says. The Constitution says they got to adjourn at 12, uh, midnight. And I come up to him again at 10 o'clock, and he says, yeah, Milk, they're supposed to bring it out. Let me see what's happening. Comes 12 o'clock, the bill never came out to be loaded on. I was really mad. And um, so um, uh, the next term, I was no longer, that was my last term in there. So I was at the end of my, my term and, you know, I was out. So Bill Eckensberger took over the bill, did some changes to it, uh, some upgrades, and he he uh, put the bill through and they passed it in the following session, which was Democratic control. And um, uh, Bill, uh, Bill became the principal sponsor of the bill as passed, but I was the principal sponsor as the bill as it was drafted. Mm -hmm. And I worked on that. And that was because of um, a constituent getting hit over the head. Constituents. Uh, I worked on, on education bills. Let me tell you a funny, not a funny one, but it is funny in a way. Um, remember I told you how important Bristol Borough was to me. Now, the public schools were allowed to transport non-public students, but not out of their ordinary route. They couldn't cross a street, they couldn't go anyway, unless it was on their ordinary route. Well, they, they were able to go uh, down to a block from Route 13, then go into Levittown Streets. And they would take St. Anne's kids, um, which was in Bristol Borough, uh, to uh, that point, and they'd have to walk across Route 13, which was very dangerous. It was a you know, two-way highway and a lot of traffic, and through a uh, uh, business district to get to the, the church. So I introduced a bill that would allow the public schools to go off their established route where a hazardous condition was concerned. And um, uh, so that, then they could go off and into Bristol and we, okay. So that bill was languishing on the, on the uh, uh, in, in committee and um, we were getting ready to really get it out when Marty Mullen, uh, I don't know if you remember Marty, but Marty, Marty, we called him the 
state representative from, from the Pope's uh, chair. Marty was a great guy, but anything that was Catholic, bang. So he amended the bill to, show, to have public school buses bus kids within 10 miles of their home. Now, for us in Pensbury, it meant taking kids over to Trenton to some private school, uh, would go to the Hill School, for example. And, uh, but boy, all hell broke out from the schools. And, and I had to make a choice. Do I leave my name on that bill as principal sponsor, or do I take it off, which I could do? And I decided that Bristol Borough was too important to me, and I left my name on as the principal sponsor, and so I became principal sponsor of the bill that did more for the non-public school system, poured more money into it because then they, they, they did away with their buses because they could transport the kids uh, from anywhere within 10 miles. And that, so I was a hero down there. <laughs> St. Anne's, they loved me. <laughs> St. Michael's and Levittown, they loved me. <laughs> but that was another bill that, uh, you know, that's the way things get done. It, it's, uh, you know, in retrospect, the school, uh, school boards are still hollering about it, but <laughs> it's there. Did, did you ever get frustrated by the system? Oh, awful. <laughs> always, always. Um, we're considering a bill that was on the floor for, uh, it was to come on the floor, to create a um, no-fault insurance system. That was an insurance bill. Uh, Herb Denenberg was the secretary, uh, they called him the insurance commissioner at the time. And um, uh, I was very strong with the labor people, and labor was strong with the bill. And I get called into Governor Schaap's office. It was in his first term. And um, the governor says, Milt, we want you to handle that bill on the floor. I said, I don't know anything about insurance. And I didn't. I didn't even know what the bill, I mean, I, in general, I knew what it was. But, but I couldn't answer. All the lawyers there were, were against the bill. I mean, the lawyers were against it. The insurance people were afraid to speak up. Uh, and. And he said, well, we can't get anybody else. And the guy from labor who was there said, Milt, come on, you handle yourself well on the floor, but I don't know anything about that. So Herb Denenberg, who was in the meeting, says, look, I'll sit at the back of the floor, and whenever they ask you a question, you stall them with a little ha-ha-ha, and I'll send you the answer. And so he had an aide that was assigned to sit with him, and they'd ask a question, and I'd ha ha ha, and he would send me the answer, and I'd read it. And this went on, and they murdered me. <laughs> I mean, the lawyers, they, they, they weren't going to take that. And they would have another question after that, and I was really very embarrassed. But when it was over, let's see, uh, the speaker then was uh, Ir Irvis, Leroy Irvis. And when it was over, and we lost. Overwhelmingly, I mean, the lawyers were really tough on us. Um, we, we lost. Uh, the speaker said, um, uh, let us give a hand to Milt Berkus. He did a, uh, an excellent job in trying to do this thing and called on at the last minute, and everybody applauded, <laughs> except the lawyers. <laughs> but that was the kind of thing that's frustrating. Uh, but. Um, you know, other things we did. I was uh, the principal, sp not the principal sponsor, I'm sorry, but I was one of the sponsors that signed on early to legislation that, that um, uh, made it uh, legal for public employees to bargain collectively. That led to the rise of AFSCME and, and you know, and, and the union movement in Harrisburg, and I was always really proud of doing that. And Jerry McEntee, was a, you know, I met him up there, but he was also a Democratic committee man in, in Northeast Philadelphia. So I knew of him, and, and he was just organizing. Well, you know where he is now. He's the international president of AFSCME. Big, 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 big job he's got. Makes a half a million dollars a year. 
but uh, he was he was coaching me on that, and, uh, and that bill got through. See, I never, I never um, uh, wanted to, even if I could, go into um, uh, leadership that is the the top officers, because I was very happy being where I was. I would have loved to have been secretary of, not I'm sorry, not secretary, but um, uh, chairman of the health and welfare committee, but um, they go by seniority and and. Um, Palermo, Anita Palermo, a nice lady, but anyway, a re very nice lady. She claimed the job and she got it. And her, Herb told me, uh, well, y you got to go by, by uh, seniority, but I became vice chairman, so I was able to do things. And before her, Sarah Anderson had been chair chairperson, and um, Sarah really took a liking to me and gave me a lot of things to do in the welfare committee, so, you know, without a title. But uh, with Anita, I, I had the title of uh, vice chairman, so I would, I would have liked to have been chairman of the committee. Did you find your committee work rewarding then? It was rewarding. I like, that's where jobs, that's where things got done. On the floor, it was just a matter of voting. And, uh, out there, it was, it was re you know, you were able to move things around to create something to listen to outside. You know, one time I listened too much to a lobbyist. I gotta tell you this quick story, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, came to see me, uh, he lobbied, I don't know who he was lobbying for, but he was lobbying against, you know when you buy meat in a, a supermarket, it's on a tray and then it's covered by a cellophane or something, or plastic, but it's on a tray. Now, he wanted to do away with those trays because the supermarket managers would, when they packaged the meat, they'd hide the fat underneath so it doesn't show. It, it's on the underside. And so I introduced the bill to, to do away with those trays that, make, uh, that they had to package them in plastic all around. In the morning, it was scheduled, it was scheduled floor debate, which floored me. So the morning it was scheduled for debate, I said to my secretary, Gail, I said, go run over to the supermarket and buy a tray and just, we'll take a chance that we get one that's... So she gave it to me and, and it was unwrapped, a little, I mean it was wrapped completely and I didn't unwrap it and I stand up to debate the issue and I hold up this tray and I said, now just look at this and I take off and sure enough there's a big blob of fat on the bottom. <laughs> I was lucky, I was lucky. And everybody started to laugh, and of course the lobby, the the union that represented the trays, <laughs> they came down and, and and we couldn't get it passed. They had a, they had enough votes there to kill it. Mm. They made it a labor issue. They lose jobs. So, wow. but that was a funny incident. I do need to stop and change on the batteries now. So sorry. Okay, sorry. I'm using some. Just started the loop. Uh, are we on? We're back. Go ahead. So let me tell you another story. You know, it's uh, customary in legislatures all over to introduce a state flag, or not a state flag, but a state tree and a state flower. And, and one day uh, somebody introduced a bill naming the state dog. And yeah, we laughed. Anyway, the bill came up for a vote. It was a resolution. It came up for a vote. And um, a, a bunch of us, when, when the speaker yelled, uh, uh, we'll do a voice vote. Eyes, eyes. Uh, all, all, all in favor, say aye. Well, a bunch of us jumped up, and barked, <laughs> and jumped up on our seats, and barked. And there was at least forty of us that did that, <laughs> and everybody laughed. But that was one of the funny things. Did the vote pass? It passed. <laughs> it always does <laughs> by acclamation. You can put in a a. A resolution. I mean, you might even be able to do it today, honoring, um, let's say, uh, Raymond Rover. He's really a dog, but it might be a person for hero heroic conduct, and it'll pass because nobody reads them. They, they just perfunctorily uh, pass all the resolutions. <laughs> so you can pass anything there in resolution. Non controversial. Non controversial. Right. Well, were there any members that you didn't see eye to eye to? Eye I, to eye with? I had a lot of floor 
debates with uh, Gene Fulmer, F-U-L-M-E-R. Gene was a good guy, Republican, uh, but he was really, um, he was on to this uh, drug thing too. And from the, he was minority at the time, and from the minority side, uh, he would have been the principal sponsor maybe um, of something, but it wouldn't, wouldn't be what we did. He would have done away with the, uh, uh, the 27 guys who we saved, uh, and we saved them as part of the legislation. But at, at any rate, uh, Gene and I had some tough times on, on the floor, and he was a tough guy, and he'd call me names. And one, one time, uh, Prendergast was in the speaker's chair, and um, uh, Herb was out for something. And he was really going over the line with me, and nobody stopped him. Usually the speaker will gavel him out of order. And Prendergast was busy talking to somebody, and nobody stopped him. But then afterwards he came over and apologized. But uh, uh, we had some tough times. Like, it was that way. I had some tough times sometimes in, inside the caucus. Like, you know, uh, I was pro-choice. Uh, uh, I was uh, anti-gun. Uh, all of those liberal things, I always was. And... Um, uh, he um, uh, and and others who like um, you mentioned him before. Uh, he just retired. Bill Rieger. Bill Rieger. Bill, and I love Bill Rieger, but uh, he made his few speeches against me at times like that. Well, um, what aspect of your job did you enjoy the most? In in the house. In the house. Well, I enjoyed working on legislation. Um, I I enjoyed to a, a lesser extent constituent service because that was very important in building up a base but but working on legislation was really intellectually uh, rewarding and and I enjoyed that I worked on a lot of bills that I didn't get uh, credit for I might have been you know a, a co-sponsor down among 92 others and that was fine uh, you know if I wanted to claim credit for any of them I would say I was a co-sponsor which was true but um, if I was interested in, in, in it, I, I would do what I could. I tried to sign on as a co-sponsor and, and then work on it uh, if I can. But in the, um, when I was a, a vice chairman of the Health uh, and Welfare Committee, I, I worked on a lot of bills that, uh, and they were all interesting and good and, and liberal. <laughs> <laughs> well, what aspect did you not enjoy? Well. You know, I really enjoyed it up there. I even enjoyed when we had, oh, I loved having cross and back debates. It was just, you know, it was the kind of thing I liked to do and I loved it. Um, I, you know, I, I just liked being there. there. There was nothing that I can really pin down that I did not enjoy. You talked about taking some hard stances on certain issues. Mm -hmm. What do you think the hardest issue you ever had to face personally as a legislator was? I think it was gun control issues. See, in, in the days I was there, the, the pro-choice abortion issue didn't really come up. Mm -hmm. It came up, uh, you know, as a sideline, but it didn't really come up as legislation, as I remember. But the, the gun issue was always coming up, and, and that was tough. Um, there are others, you know, the, like some right-wing legislation, that I would oppose. I can't offhand recall bills, but uh, uh, I, I would oppose them and, and engage in floor debates as much as I could. I loved that. Yeah. People talk about hard votes, especially around budget times. Mm -hmm. Did you have any hard votes? I had a lot of hard votes. I had to do it. A hard vote was my keeping my name on the busing bill. <laughs> yeah. That was hard to do, but I did it. Um, yeah, we had a lot, a lot of hard votes. In fact, one time, as usual, they ran over the, the time that, you know, June 30th, and I had, I had scheduled a, um, a class in uh, drug um, rehabilitation at Yale University, and, and I was due to go up there the first two weeks in July, and, um, or maybe in the, yeah, the first two weeks, and uh, they were keeping us over. And so I said, uh, I said to Irfis, Roy, I, I really got to go up and take this course. It'll be helpful to me. 
And he said, look, you can go. But you leave your phone number wherever you're going to be, and if we need your vote, we'll call you. And sure enough, on the third day up there, they called me. I had to hop on a plane, and, and they made the reservation for me. Fly down, go in and vote, get on a plane, and go back to Yale. But that was, you know, I had to do it. So I missed the day at the classes. <laughs> wow. But there were other hard votes that I had to take because of... Here, here's, here's one that was typical. The, the, um, the uh, legislature one time uh, passed a bill as part of the budget uh, at, to, to put a tax on insurance premiums, not policies, but premiums. So there would be a tax on your premium. The uh, insurance industry came down on us uh, real hard, and I voted for the bill because, uh, you know, the caucus voted for it, and Herb wanted us to vote for it. Then I went home for the weekend, and man, they were waiting at my <laughs> One of the ladies, who was a widow, and she was a committee woman of mine, and she was a very good worker, and very loyal to me. She was screaming at me. I said, well, what's the matter, Marie? She said, they're going to take away my insurance. I'm living in that, blah, blah. I said, nobody's taking away your insurance. It's a tax on the premium. Well, I'll have to pay more money, blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, but the insurance people were telling them that they're going to take it. It's the first step in taking away your insurance. And, and some people believed it. I went back following Monday, because I had a lot of calls that day. Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, I was busy on the phone. I went back on Monday, I went up to see Herb. I said, Herb, I gotta, I've got to do this, Herb. I'm going to introduce a resolution rescinding that tax that we passed. And Herb tried to argue me out of it, saying it'll go away, it'll go away. I said, no, no. When, when Marie Gillinger came in front of me, I haven't said that name in 20 years, when Marie Gillinger came in front of me, and she was a really loyal person and a decent person and a widow, and was crying, I gotta, I gotta listen to her. And so he said, well, you gotta do what you gotta do. And I introduced the bill, I put, got other sponsors, and uh, we, we rescinded that tax. And that was a hard vote because I didn't like to go against the caucus, but uh, I did it when I had to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it tough to go against leadership? It was tough to go against leadership. But I didn't, you know, I didn't that, do that too often. But uh, when I had to do it, I did it. Mm -hmm. When you recount your experiences on the, on the House floor or as a, just as a member, do you have a favorite story? Well, I've told you a couple of them. Um, besides those, there was, there was a, a time, another budget story, and we were one vote shy, the Democrats were in charge, and we were one vote shy of passing the budget. And that vote was an, a very old guy from um, a farm area, he was a farmer, and uh, I forget what county he was from. And he was not going to vote for it because there were tax increases in it. And, but he sat in the seat. And he was a nice guy. But, you know, we, we had the levers that you push. He held his hand over the lever so nobody would push it. And he had it pushed no, and he held his hand over there. And he put his head down, and this whip came over to talk to him, and, uh, and the others, and the speaker came down. And, and then they brought a senator in. Um, I'll get his name soon, uh, from the same area. And I don't know what he said to him, but he straightened up, took back his hand, the senator flipped his lever, <laughs> and, and that got the bill passed. <laughs> but that was tough. Wow. That was tough. I remember a day we had a, um, a legislator, getting a lot older than me, who was, um, who had that, I forget what you call it, NAR something, where you fall asleep in the middle of oh, a sentence? Narcolepsy. narcolepsy. So he would stand at the microphone, and they always gave him the seat next to the microphone. He would get up to make a speech, and he was good. And he'd stand there, and one of the legislators was assigned to catch him. 
And in the middle of his speech, he'd doze off and they'd sit him down. And then when he woke up, he'd go back up and take off where he left off. And, and this was, you know, it was kind of tragic, but, but we accommodated him. And mm -hmm. uh, it was good. he got elected year after year. Yeah. He could never be beat. He retired. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a fondest memory? Well, <clears throat> there, there were a lot of them, but I think the day we passed the drug bills, that, that was really the highlight of my whole career. And, and then, uh, to show you how fond I was, on April 14th, the governor, 1972, Governor Schapp signed the bills and we had all of the, the people who sponsored it stand around him and, you know, they, they do. And every year thereafter, on April 14th, they had the governor come out and, and call the members of the Governor's Council on Drug and Alcohol Abuse, which was part of that bill. And I got to tell you a little about that. But call them to come up and stand with the governor and, and get a picture taken as an anniversary. This continued until Thornburg became governor. And the first time he was going to do it, and they didn't call me because I'm a Democrat and I was county chairman and, you know, I didn't support them. But I happened to be in Harrisburg that day, and I saw one of the members, and he said, oh, Milt, you're coming over to... I said, no, I'm, I don't know about it. What, what is it? He told me. So I went over. But I didn't go and stand behind him, although Pat Crawford was Republican, and, and who was very helpful in getting the bill passed, and she was his co-sponsor. She wanted me to come up. Come on, Milt, come on. And I, I, I said, no, I've not been invited. And I just stood there and stared at the, at the governor. <laughs> and when the picture was over, I walked over to him and I shook his hand and I said, thank you for commemorating my bill. And I really appreciate it. And he was bewildered. He didn't know anything about it. It was the people that had set the picture up. That, you know, and they never told him. Later on, uh, Doris Fleming was it? No, it wasn't Doris, it was Fleming was her last name. She became, what happened, let me tell you this because it's an important part of the story. One of the things that bill, that, that bill did, Act 64, I guess it was, or 63, one of them, was set up the Governor's Council on Drug and Alcohol Abuse. Now that council was an independent body report, re, that reported only to the governor. And they were, they were the single state agency for the distribution of funds, both state and federal, to treatment programs all over the state. And so if anybody wanted to get their program funded, like today incorporated, they would have to present their plan for the coming year, what they wanted to do with the money, how much they wanted, present it to the council, the council would review it, and, and if the council approved it, they'd get their money. So you can see it's a powerful body. Now, we designated the governor as the chairman of the council. But we also said, knowing full well he's not going to come to these meetings and listen to all that, uh, that the governor could designate somebody else to be chairman in his place. And of course he designated me. So I was chairman of the council, with, which I loved. That, that was great. And uh, uh, we had a, a, lot, uh, a lot to do and a lot going on. And, and that was enjoyable. We, you know, wherever I went, it was the Burkus bill. And they, were, they would say, did you bring the Burkus money with you? And I said, I, I got four dollars in my pocket. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun with that. But they got a lot of money. And it was all out of that bill. And, and the council, went. at any rate, when Thornburg became governor, he appointed uh, this lady named Fleming, a nice lady, very competent. But she had been running uh, a lobbying group that was lobbying for, for programs, for drug and alcohol programs. But she was a staunch Republican. And he was, she was appointed to head the drug and alcohol programs, but not through the council. They, they downgraded the council and they gave the whole program to the Department of Health. And she was designated as Deputy Secretary of Health in charge of drug and alcohol programs. So, uh, and she was tough. And um, uh, 
uh, we were not good friends. But now, turn, turn forward to a year ago, and uh, Representative Di Girolamo from Bucks County, Ben Salem, is introducing a bill creating the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs. And that's exactly what our council did. And I get a call from Deb Beck, who, you know Deb? Mm -hmm. Deb calls me and we had a great talk on the phone because I hadn't talked for years. And she said, can you come to this hearing and talk about the council and what it did? I said, I'd love to. So I traveled up to Westchester and I appeared at the hearing. But when I walked in, and she said to me, you'll be surprised at who's going to be there. When I walked in, Fleming comes over to me and hugs me, <laughs> kisses me on the cheek. It's so good to see you, Milt. And, and I said, God, what are you doing here? And she says, I'm going to be testifying in favor of the Geralimo's uh, bill. And it turns out that she had stayed in Pennsylvania for some years, but then took a job in Ohio as the, the uh, what did they call it? the secretary of drug and alcohol programs. And, and that was a cabinet level job. And she, that was her last job. So that convinced her that we were right. So she was, Deb Beck got hold of her and she came back to testify. And when she got up on the stand, uh, in the seat, I was sitting next to her. She was first, I was second. And she said, it is so good to be sitting here next to the godfather of drug treatment programs in this state. And, and you know, I burst out laughing and Deb burst out, she started applauding and, and, and that was a great time, a great moment. But that was just last year. Wow. Yeah. And I testified once more in front of this committee and had the hearings down here. And the bill was passed in the House and it's tied up in the Senate, but maybe they can get it out. Who knows? Well, I usually ask, what do you want your political, political legacy to be? Drug and alcohol. Maybe that's it. That's it. I that's mean. it. That's what I did. <laughs> that, that's, that's, what the, that's what I was known for for a long time. And when I took that job in Philadelphia, it's, you know, my connection with drug and alcohol programs was, was fit right in because most of the kids we worked with were drug users or alcohol users, most of the in inmates we worked with. Mm. So it fit right in. It did. What yeah. a great... Yeah, it's one of those things that turned, uh, turned my life around because I was looking for a job. The, I had mentioned earlier about A. Oswald Michener who got me into Temple. And then James Michener, mm -hmm. who I worked for, well, that's where the name Michener comes together. Mm -hmm. There were no relations, but they had the same name. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, you said you, you're retired. Yes. So are you active in any politics right now? Not, I'm not, this year I'm not active in politics. It's local issues, it's a county campaign. My heart's not in it, I'm not too happy with the candidates. So I'm not in it, but you know, I'm, I'm not supporting Republicans or anything, and I will vote Democrat. Um, but I'm also active in other things. Uh, and one thing I'm doing, and when somebody questions me, I say, I always talk the talk, and now I'm walking the walk. Now, not too many people know this, so they'll know it now. I'm, my wife and I are both volunteers at Planned Parenthood. There's a abortion clinic in Bucks County, and we go to that clinic every Friday morning and serve as escorts for the young people that are coming in there for abortions. They've had appointments, they've been through counseling and all. And there are a group of pickets out there every Friday morning, and they march up and down in front of the place, and they have a bullhorn, they scream at us. And um, uh, one time uh, they brought in um, a whole bunch, I happened to miss that day because we go every other week, but uh, they brought in a whole bunch of it. It was a hundred people they, they brought in that were pro-life, anti-abortion, and they stormed the place. And they stood at the doors and nobody could get in, none of the workers, and of course the people coming for abortions and mostly young kids, and they were scared. And of course they had to call the police, the police cleared them out. That was the worst incident. Otherwise, we get harassment from them, and we're under strict orders not to answer. So we don't, don't get engaged with them. Uh, under our breath, we'll call them names, but uh, we don't get engaged. And we let them scream and holler, but we do what we have to do. 
you know, these, these uh, I call them kids, they're mostly teenagers that come in there. Some come with their mothers, some come with boyfriends, some come with girlfriends, some come with husbands. But the nine out of ten of the people that come for abortions are, are teenagers, or maybe early 20s, and, you know, go up to that. But, um, and, and they're coming, they've been through all of the, because Planned Parenthood does that, they've been through all of the counseling and what the alternatives are, and what you can do, and what might happen if uh, you know, things go wrong in the procedure, and, and everything. Uh, by law, they have to do most of that, so they do it. And some of them have gone to other counselors, or they've gone to doctors, and doctors have said, you know, that's all you can do. And uh, they're, they're really, you know, they're really under stress. I mean, this, this is a big thing for them. It's not small. Nobody, is, uh, nobody considers it to be uh, a small thing. And they come in under stress, and the first thing they hear these guys screaming at them with bullhorns. Well, what we do now, we got two radios real loud, and we play music, and we try to drown out the bullhorns. And we, we were successful in that. And one of the kids said, why, why are you playing music out here? And I said, the bullhorns. Yeah, so that's what, but that's one thing we do. I'm also the, they call it president, that's really chairman, I, president of the local chapter of the AARP. Now, not too many people know about local cha chapters. What we do in the local chapter, we don't sell insurance and we don't sell uh, uh, automobiles, uh, you know. What we do is work on senior issues. So I work, worked hard on the Medicare thing. I was against the national when they, they, they flipped and, and re supported the Part D, the, the drug thing, because they gave they, George Bush the one or two votes they needed to push, push it over the top. I worked hard on Social Security. We got that stopped uh, where they wanted to privatize Social Security. We stay aware of the property tax is a big issue for seniors. And we have monthly meetings, which we invite, invite a speaker. And we had Chris King at our last meeting, and we'll have Tony at, a, at another meeting, and, and uh, you know, the other representatives from down here, from Bucks County. And um, that's the other thing I do mainly. Politically, I do little things if people ask me. Somebody come running for office asks me for advice, like I get a lot of that. And, and you know, I'll talk to them, meet with them, help them out. Uh, a couple of years ago, I guess it's about four years ago, I got really tied into a campaign in Lower Southampton. They hadn't elected a Democrat in years. And, and this young lady that was running for um, supervisor, Connie Brain, was real sharp and bright, and I knew her from the party, she was very active. And she called me up and uh, <clears throat> asked me if I could help them. So I went down as a volunteer, and I met with them every week, once a week, and I advised them on literature and campaign things they should do and strategies. And, and they won. They won for the first time in many, many years. And uh, they now have a majority in that town of Democrats on the Board of Supervisors, and they elect the school board members, too, which they never had before. So that's, you know, I, I like to do that kind of thing, but I. I recognize that I'm 83 years old, and, and I'm losing it, and, and uh, so I don't push myself. If I can remember something, I'll help them. <laughs> yeah. When do you think you first had that political aspiration bug? Because that's, that's another question I, yeah. I usually ask, but I don't think I asked you. You know, it may have been hidden within me from what I heard my father say, and, and when they had these speakers out there from mainly from the Communist Party uh, speaking. You know, I got to hear them. And, and then they had, you know, Republican and Democratic candidates. Franklin Roosevelt was my hero. Uh, I always regretted that I could never vote for him because the voting age was 21. When I was 18, I was already in the Philippine Islands and wasn't able to vote anyhow because uh, I wasn't 21. I couldn't vote until I got home and then I voted for Truman the first time. But um, uh, that's when I got the bug. And I really got the bug for more for national politics when I went to that first convention in 1964. 
And then I went to five more conventions after that. I, I just loved those conventions. And I knew that, you know, you don't, you know, your voice doesn't mean anything. Your vote is nothing. I was in, in Chicago in 68 when those kids rioted and, and we couldn't get to the uh, convention hall. Out there and I forget what they called it. Uh, we couldn't get there because the buses were on strike and the trolley cars were on strike and taxi cabs weren't on strike. And the only way we can get there was that the mayor, Mayor Daly, the, the old man, uh, who was the, the boss of uh, Chicago, he commandeered every private bus he could find, school buses and everything else, and set up a schedule to pick us up. And we had a beater when the, the bus was there and to take us back, back to our hotels. And, and, and I was in the middle of them rioting at the hotel where Hubert Humphrey was staying. And they had a, you know, the police were out there in force, but um, it was a really telling experience. It was, it was tough. Well, you said you really didn't have aspirations for leadership. Did you ever have any aspirations for any higher office? Only once. Here's what happened. They created a, a reapportionment. I forget what year it was. It might have been 72 might have been 72, but they expanded the 6th Congressional District, which had been all of Bucks County, I mean the lower end of Bucks County, into Philadelphia. And so there was a part of Philadelphia, Philadelphia is going to lose a, a, a um, state senator, so there was a part of Philadelphia in the district. And um, I really wanted to run for that district. And I talked to, to Feynman and the leaders. And I talked to, um, I forget his name, he was the uh, city chairman in Philadelphia, it will come to me soon. And uh, he said, oh, you'd be fine, Milt, what do you like about blah, blah, blah. And the way it works is that they create a plan, and the Republicans create one, the Democrats create one. And, when he, and, and the district, inc incidentally, was represented at the time by Bob Rothner, the Philadelphia part of the district. And, so they had these plans, and the Republicans one wanted to protect Bobby Ravner, and, and you know our people wanted to put me in that district to beat them. And as of the night before they were to vote on the plan, and we had the votes to pass the Democratic plan, as of the night before, I was slated to be the candidate, informally. You know, no, nobody ever said anything formally. And when they brought the, the map out, it was, my, my house was located a half a block from the boundary line. The, the cross street and I was a half a block on the other side. So if I didn't want to move, <laughs> I couldn't run. Well, that was my ambition. I never had an ambition for Congress because I saw if Michener couldn't win, who could? <laughs> and until Peter Costner came along and we had a, he was a protege of mine. Uh, and I convinced him to change his party from Republican to Democrat, and we ran him for Congress, and, and it was a good campaign he had, but John Renninger was the, who's dead now, he was a state house member, and uh, he um, was the Republican candidate, and he took it for granted that he was going to win, and he lost by a, about a thousand votes. Yeah. But until then, I didn't think we would ever be able to win the Congress. Well, you talked about giving advice to, to people that are looking to run mm -hmm. or as a party, maybe giving them advice. What would your advice be for new members of the House of Representatives? One, pay attention to, cons to constituents. Do your cons have people, have people who work for you, staff people, who have good contacts with the Department of Transportation. There's always problems there. Department of Welfare, Health, have them have inside contacts that they can call if they need something done for a constituent. So constituent services is the first thing. And the second thing is to pay attention to your people, what they want rather than what the party wants. And if there's something, I, I don't say cross party lines, but if there is something that, that might not go with the leadership, you fight to get it get it on the calendar. And if it can't go, it can't go. But, uh, but you put up a fight and you can say to your people back home, 
that uh, you did it. The, the worst thing really about being in the legislature, you asked me that before, is that you have to run every two years. It's terrible. You never stop running. The day after you're elected, you're, you're running for the next time. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that's the worst part of it. And now, when I was there, I didn't have to raise a lot of money. I mean, I, had, I don't remember spending hardly anything in my campaign. I printed little cards and, and give out at the polls. But um, I didn't have to raise a lot of money. But uh, today, God, they, they spend, I don't know how much uh, King and uh, Matt Wright spend, but boy, they spend a lot of money over there. Tony doesn't spend as much, but he's, he's got a better district. But in Middletown, they, they had a good fight, a big fight, and, and King uh, was a, another protege of mine. King um, uh, beat an incumbent, which is hard to do. Yeah, but that, you know, pay attention to your district first, and then stick with the party on, on basic issues. Thank you very much. Okay.